We are joined by uh, the man we've been mentioning uh, very often, of course, Stephen Mnuchin is the Treasury Secretary of the United States, joins us here at Post 9. Nice to have you. Great to be here with uh, you. Thank you. Of course. You. Um, trade is what we've been spending a lot of time talking I about that imagine. and a very strong jobs report, which I'm sure you'd want to talk about. But let's start on trade if we can. Um, you've been addressing some questions on it even prior to the proclamation of yesterday, and you most recently had said that you were comfortable that we're going to manage through this that being the tariffs, so that it is not detrimental to our growth projections for economic growth. That's correct. Why are you comfortable? Well, as we've talked about from the very beginning going back to the campaign, the president's number one objective is to create economic growth, 3% sustained GDP. A year ago, we had everybody saying we'd never get to that. We've now had two quarters of 3% or, or higher. So we're well on our way. We got tax reform done. That was the first step. It was a, 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 big, a big part of this. But we've been doing regulatory relief. We've been talking about trade from day one. That's part of this. And the objective is free and fair trade. So the president is very focused on creating better opportunities for U.S. companies. And that's going to lead to more growth. So we've had very direct conversations with China. That's obviously our biggest trade deficit. Uh, we're very focused on NAFTA. So the president is very focused on, just as we were during tax reform, and making sure that American business was competitive on taxes, now making sure we have a fair deal on trade. Right, but what gives you the confidence that there won't be deleterious effects from tariffs like this, not just on the end users of the products and the potential for the price going up, but more importantly, as many have discussed, the possibility of our allies in this, for example, the EU or China, uh, not an ally necessarily, responding in kind and therefore an escalation of, uh, of a trade war, perhaps, that really does impact the U.S. economy. Well, obviously, any time we do anything, we have to analyze the risks. But if you want to move forward with the agenda for American companies, you have to be willing to take certain risks. And, you know, I, I would say let's look at the situation with North Korea. The president went through with a series of maximum pressure. We've done more sanctions in the last year than the entire last 10 years. And those sanctions worked. So we're now sitting with a situation where North Korea is prepared to negotiate. It's the same thing with our trading partners. We have to defend the U.S. interest. So tariffs are important to preserve the, the steel industry. Uh, we've already exempted out Canada and Mexico. I can tell you I've had many conversations with uh, many of my counterparts. Uh, we have two ways of doing exemptions. So the president can do exemptions. Right. And my expectation is there may be some other countries that he considers in the next two weeks. And then to the extent there's specific products that are going to create issues, uh, the Secretary of Commerce has that authority, and he will be publishing regulations very quickly on how those products could be exempt. At the end of the press conference, as the president was exiting the room, he was asked one question about transshipments. And he did indicate that we're going to deal with that. What did that mean? Well, we've been very clear in our discussions, let's just say starting with Canada and Mexico, that if we're going to exempt them, we're not going to allow them to transship Chinese steel. Having said that, in the case of Canada, we have very good two-way trade of, uh, of steel going back and forth. And I actually saw Bill Morneau you had on this morning, and he commented, which uh, I would also say we've spoken several times in the last week already. Secretary, uh, the president made a statement near the end of his remarks, I believe, that raised a few eyebrows. He seemed to be referring to NATO, saying that some of our allies or so-called allies treat us the worst, and over the next couple of weeks we'll be looking perhaps at military spending as a factor in how these exemptions might work. Can you explain how those two things are related? Well, the president's going to take into many considerations when you look at national security. But, it, you know, the president's been very clear. We're spending 4 percent of GDP. Many of our allies are spending 1 percent of GDP and not making commitments to go up to the 2 percent. So the president is very clear. He, if we're in NATO, he wants to make sure that NATO gets more money so that NATO can protect all of us and fulfill its goal. Any you, reservations about tying a couple of issues like that together? Because some trade experts are kind of wary of tying outside issues to trade that way. Look, I, I understand, but one of the great things is this is not a conventional president. And because of that, we're getting results that we wouldn't have otherwise seen. So, I mean, again, I go back to tax reform. A lot of people said we'd never get tax reform done. A lot of people said the U.S. economy could never grow at 3%. 
the well, president. Well, it did grow. Uh, there were quarters that grew at three percent. There were. I mean, there to were, be fair. No, no. But were, I'm saying there's a lot of people who still believe that we cannot get to three percent sustained growth. And you're right. We've had several quarters. We're not there yet, and that's why we still have a lot of work to do. What, one more on trade. There's not one, but two editorials in the Wall Street Journal today, hardly a liberal outlet, which say that the present moment is dangerous. The departure of Gary Cohn, somebody who was pro-free trade, uh, and the situation with the tariffs, that they worry about him driving into the Herbert Hoover ditch. Is this a dangerous moment? So first of all, on Gary, you know, uh, Gary and I have worked together for a long period of time. Uh, I like Gary a lot. We're sorry to see him go. We have a very deep economic bench. Uh, Gary wasn't the only person talking about trade. Uh, we've had a lot of economic analysis from Kevin Hassett and others. And I can assure you that President Trump is going to be no Herbert Hoover. So there is no risk. But, uh, you know, look, the Wall Street Journal is part of the classic free traders, which don't want to do anything to interfere with trade. And as the president has said, he's a free trader, but you know, why do we have these trade deficits? Why is it fair that China gets to sell anything they want into the United States other than things we block for national security? Well, on the other hand, we can't sell into their markets. Our cars have a 25 percent tariff going into China. Their cars have a two and a half percent I'm still wondering tariff. what cars we're talking about from China, by the way. Um, just, I mean, not a lot of Americans we're, are buying we're not Chinese now, cars. We're not now, but trust me, they're very focused on electronic cars. Uh, electric cars, and they intend to be a big competitor. So, I mean, we just use that as an example of where, you know, again, we can't sell cars into China with 25 percent tariffs. Uh, understood. You know, the focus on China, of course, is understood, and it's interesting you took it to electronic vehicles and their advances when it comes to technology, which leads to my next question. Uh, we've been covering it closely here, uh, the fight between Broadcom and Qualcomm. Broadcom, a company that wants to take over Qualcomm. Yes, I know, I know them well, as you know. <laughs> I know you do. Just want to make sure for our viewers, because we're changing uh, uh, subjects here a bit. Uh, Treasury is part of the CFIUS review, an important part. You guys chose to put out a four-page letter earlier this week that was somewhat extraordinary, outlining the potential objections that Treasury, as a part of CFIUS, has to Broadcom's potential acquisition of Qualcomm, related to 5G, to new technology advances the Chinese may make. Why are you potentially opposed to that deal? So I, I want to be careful with what I say, but I will comment broadly on it, which is uh, CFIUS is a very important set of tools that we have to protect national security. Uh, I chair CFIUS. It's an interagency process. And traditionally, people think of it as very secretive. And the, and the reason why it's viewed as secretive, it, we get a lot of confidential information. We obviously can't share that information. We go through the process, and at the end of the process, one of two things normally occurs. We normally tell the company that if they're not going to get approval, they're not going to get approval, and they can voluntarily withdraw a transaction, and we won't publicize that. If the company refuses to do that, I have to send the transaction to the president and he signs it. And as I tell most of these companies, I can pretty much assure you that, that there's a very, very high likelihood. So traditionally, you don't see a lot of publicity around. No, which is why this was somewhat extraordinary, this, this, because this, you did list a lot of the potential objections this, and concerns. This was a unique situation. Um, we did come out publicly where we don't normally do that. Uh, I'm not going to comment on all the specifics of, of why we did that, but this was a unique situation. And I, as the rest of the committee, are fully prepared to use our powers to protect national security. So that deal is dead? No, I'm not commenting on whether that deal is dead or not. Uh, what we did come out and say is uh, effectively that the, the vo board vote should be postponed while CFIUS could review additional information. And Mr. Secretary, I'm wondering whether there are other companies whose intellectual property and, uh, and strength in R&D investment, perhaps even relationship with the U.S. government, put them in a similar category to Qualcomm. You mentioned Intel's R&D investment in that letter, but there are other companies like, I don't know, uh, Microsoft, Oracle, even Apple, that have certain assets where you can imagine if iOS or certain chips fell into the hands uh, of a country that the U.S. wasn't comfortable with, it, it could potentially cause issues. Do you look at some other companies, or might you look at some other companies from a CFIUS perspective in a similar way? Uh, to the extent that there is any proposed transaction or 
on a significant technology company, I can assure you it will most likely come under CFIUS jurisdiction and will be reviewed carefully. But uh, from a national security perspective, should we be thinking of technology companies, uh, powerful technology companies based in the U.S. as more potential national security assets? Uh, again, a lot of these issues have to deal with classified information, so I want to be very careful what I say. But again, broadly, you can assume that technology companies have significant national security interests to the United States government. But when we put together solar panels, washing machines, Broadcom, Qualcomm, steel, and aluminum, this is not a more protectionist administration? Very, very different situation. So, I mean, again, let, let me just be clear. CFIUS is a national security issue. It has nothing to do with uh, trade or, or anything else. So I, I don't think you should in any way put those in the other situation. But it does have to the, do with the concern about China potentially stealing our intellectual property. I mean, Huawei was focused on in the Treasury letter. And I know the USTR right now has a Section 301 investigation of Chinese trade practices or stealing of our intellectual property. Is that going to be the next battleground, do you think, when it comes uh, okay. to trade? Uh, that is something we're discussing internally. We've updated the president on this. Um, I think, as you know, I, I met with my Chinese counterpart, Leo Ho, last week. We had very good discussions for two days. I met with the Chinese ambassador yesterday. So I can assure you on the trade areas, um, we've ha we're having very direct discussions. You know, the president came out and, and said that our objective is to see them reduce the trade deficit by $100 billion over the next year. So we're having very direct discussions, and we hope to make progress with them. Do you Speaking think of the tensions with China, though, are bound to heat up, given those investigations, given the move on tariffs yesterday? I think the good news is President Trump and President Xi have the best relationship of any two uh, presidents in, in the history of the U.S. And, and Chinese relationship. So I think that there's, there's very good communication. And on a high level, uh, President Xi uh, uh, and, and others have acknowledged that it's their objective and in their national interest as well to work with us to reduce the trade deficit. Speaking of direct discussions. President Trump agreeing to sit down with Kim Jong-un sometime in the next two months. Already there are criticisms that the president shouldn't be giving the leader of North Korea that kind of platform and that kind of standing. Why is this a good idea? You know, I, I find it incredible, okay, how people comment on these things. We, we had the president, through his leadership, had the most direct and forceful impact on instructing me to do sanctions and come together of a pressure, maximum pressure campaign against North Korea. He was criticized because we were putting too much pressure on them. We worked very closely with China and our allies and the UN. We had multiple resolutions. The president, as you know, is determined that there won't be nuclear weapons on the peninsula. I think this is a very important movement forward that they were willing to say that they'll stop the testing, uh, and that they're willing to have discussions. So I view this as something that, uh, you know, th this, is, this is what we want to see in terms of movement going forward. But the president has also said there'll be no sanctions relief while we're having those discussions. So I find it hard to believe that the people who criticized him for putting on too much pressure are now criticizing him for talking. It's, it's a bit amusing. We Mr. Secretary, I want to, want to get to this jobs report that's got the market rallying this morning uh, as well. Jeremy Siegel just a few moments ago basically saying it hit the sweet spot. How much attention should we be paying to the participation rate versus some of the other positive factors, that, you know, the upward revision uh, in this jobs report? Well, you know, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that. And let me first put this in perspective, that I, I think all these numbers are important, but we do have to look at them and we want long-term benefits. One of the things that I thought was good about the report this morning is the participation rate increased. So one of the things we've been talking about, everyone has said, aren't you concerned about inflation given we're at full employment uh, and given the tax cuts and the growth in the economy? And my comment is, we're not really at full employment because of the participation rate. So uh, I'm pleased it ticked up a little bit. That's, that's a number that I'm very focused on. I was at JetBlue this morning meeting with the workers who had the benefits of the tax cuts. And one of the things they talked a lot about was job training 
and how to bring people into that industry uh, early on. So, I mean, I think one of the issues with the participation rate is we got to create more jobs, but we also got to make sure we have the proper training for people to have the jobs. Continued debate, of course, about just uh, how much economic growth will be generated by uh, the tax cuts. Um, this week uh, at Harvard, you had a conservative economist, Robert Barrow and Jason Furman, a, 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 a to the left economist, both come out and say we agree about $1.2 trillion um, in debt will be generated over the next decade as a result. You obviously disagree with that, but how do you rebut those claims from at least two people from opposite sides of the spectrum? Look, I, I acknowledge there's smart people who don't agree with us, okay? But what I would say is we fundamentally think we'll get the growth. By definition, if we get the growth, we'll pay for it. So it's it's a cause and effect. And what I can tell you from traveling around the country and meeting with not just CEOs but workers, we're seeing this in the tax plan. We're seeing the fact that moving from a worldwide system to a territorial system is making U.S. companies competitive. When I was in Davos, you know, we met with many companies that are now talking about putting operations in the U.S., building things here. There's no question, you know, one of the single biggest parts of the tax plan was changing a broken system, worldwide taxes deferral. Uh, I'm going to see Apple next week and meet with their workers. As you know, they're bringing back a ton of money into the U.S. Tim Cook's made very big commitments here. So uh, we're already seeing this working, and we're already seeing workers get the benefit of this. Let so, me tell you, for the JetBlue workers I met with today, they were very excited to get $1,000 bonuses. I'm sure. Broad agreement on the tax cuts making us more competitive, but then a lot of economists said, wait, tax cuts, but then there's also this big increase in spending. The people who fret about all that Treasury supply that's going to come on in the next year by large amounts, I mean, Rick Santelli is going to be incredibly busy with all of these auctions. We shouldn't be worried about rising interest rates because there's so much supply of this stuff coming on? Well, as you know, the forward curve expects rates to go up. So, again, without predicting rates, the market expects rates to go up. The question will be, do they go up faster and further than, than the market predicts? And uh, given my view of Fed independence, I'm not going to make any comments No, but you're on, going to be issuing on, an enormous on, on amount on of debt. Interest rates. Mr. Secretary. I, I think we're very comfortable with our financing needs. We're very comfortable with how we're going to look at it across the curve. So we've extended the maturities quite significantly over the last few number of years. But I would acknowledge, longer term, we do have to look at the debt. The fact that the debt went from 10 trillion to 20 trillion in the last eight years is concerning. As the president said, a lot of that money was spent in the Middle East. Um, so th those are issues we're going to have to look at longer term. And you don't worry about the Chinese. If we talk more about trade, they're such big buyers of Treasury. Those two issues conflate. They do a buyer strike. And uh, you know, as I, as I look at the Treasury holdings all around the world, they're very diversified. It's the most liquid market in the world. So I'm, I'm comfortable with our financing needs. Uh, and finally, uh, with Mr. Cohn's departure, any sense as to who will replace him? Will yours be perhaps one of the lone voices that is not protectionist in nature in the White House? <laughs> Again, the president is not a protectionist. The president believes in fighting for fair trade. But we already have a lot of people who uh, have volunteered for the job. We'll look at this carefully as we looked at the Fed jobs and other things and making recommendations to the president. Fairly soon, you think? Or? Um, we're going to take our time. So we've got a good team, and we'll, we'll look at all the appropriate people. Mr. Secretary, thank you for spending thank time. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Stephen Mnuchin, Treasury Secretary of the United States. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Hey there, thanks for checking out CNBC on YouTube. Be sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all of the day's biggest stories. You can also click on any of the videos around me to watch the latest from CNBC. Thanks for watching.